hey, welcome to Bonehead. It's Patrick Lucier. <laughs> now, this is one of the more exciting guests that we've had. And I know I say this, but I really mean it this time. <laughs> because I feel that you and Todd, had you been, let's say Drive Angry was a Corman film that came out in the 70s, you would have been gods. Yes, as it, as it is, we weren't. No, and but <laughs> you are you have a big fandom, and we much appreciate your work. And we're going to go through your work, and I have a lot of questions, and we all have some several questions. But I I was I was sitting here. Should I say this to him? Should I not say this to him? But I, I really wanted to, and I hope you're not offended by that. And I hope you know where that comes from. God no. From. I I, I uh, years ago worked with uh, Lou Arkoff, son of yeah. Sam Arkoff. Oh yeah, and uh, who would always say, you know, I'm just the son of a monster man, yeah. and uh, and uh, you know, he taught to tell stories about th being 13, threading the monster movies up in his father's projector at the house to show his friends the monster really? movies, because his father would use them as the focus group for the Roger Corman films. Nice. Um, you know, I, I love all that stuff. But you know, his kid probably it's all normal. So as uh, us thinking about what a wonderful childhood that would have been to him, it was just. Who's dead? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think Lou always appreciated it. I think he always thought it was pretty okay, special. Okay, good. Because <laughs> but, yeah, he, I, he, he, he talks about it with a lot of reverence. Okay, I would, yeah. Right. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and get started. How in the hell did you end up from, from Canada to Hollywood? And what was, let's start with there and let's go through what movies did you love as a child? Ah, oh, all right. Uh, the Survivors, of course. Yeah, Survivors. I didn't really love that. Uh, I did. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. The movies I loved as a child, a lot of them were sort of forbidden fruit, things you weren't allowed to watch. Um, I remember becoming obsessed with movies like, you know, Land of Time Forgot, with the Doug McClure movie. Yeah. Uh, oh. Because I wasn't allowed to see it because I was told it would be too scary. <laughs> um, not quite the case. Um, no. Charles I don't think Bronson. Doug McClure was in yeah. anything that was scary intentionally. Yeah. Charles Bronson in Humanoids of the Deep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Charles Bronson in, you know, uh, Breakheart Pass. I remember being a big influence. That's your great Jerry Goldsmith score. Yeah. Uh, but then things like, you know, the things that really stuck with me movie wise are things like, you know, the Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, uh, the oh, original the Joe Sargent movie with yes. Robert Shaw and Walter Matha, speaking of Walter Matha. Um, which I'm still a massive fan of. Jaws, um, and you know, an incredible uh, film. Uh, Star Wars. Uh, it was where you learned that. Oh my God, there's an actual job making movies. How do I get that? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, seeing that uh, when I was 13. Uh, you know, after the last day of school, my mom took me uh, to see Star Wars. What is this movie? Um, and just being like, <gasps> this is the best thing ever. Um, you know, having read the Starlog, Starlog magazine ahead of time, number seven, I think, where it was on the cover. Um, yeah. yeah, so those, those kind of films, Close Encounters, obviously, you know, you started going down, all the thing, uh, you know, all those movies ticking up, uh, Poltergeist, uh, Raiders Lost Ark, and, and uh, you know, the, those films you became very obsessive over, which people are still obsessive over now. Yeah, but your family wasn't in the business, right? No, no, not at all. But my, my father, you know, uh, he had a job from the time he was 10. He had a paper route delivering hundreds of papers every day. Um, he ended up, you know, becoming a bank teller and working at a bank for uh, a lot of years back when before they were totally evil. And uh, um, now he says all those bankers should be jailed. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah. Um, but he always wanted to be a DJ. Uh-huh. Um, and his, his, uh, parents wouldn't allow him to do that. And, uh, cause he had to work, he had to. So when I wanted to get in the film industry, he was incredibly supportive. Um, and would be very much, you know, I, I, uh, if that's what you want to do, then just do it with all you have. Um, if you want it bad enough, you'll get it. Uh, and that was incredibly supportive. My, you know, I come from a family of, other than him, my mom was a teacher, my brother's a teacher, my sister's a teacher, uh, both of them retired now. Um, and I was not, <laughs> um, 
uh, but a lot of it, you know, also my fascination with movies and horror movies in particular started with my sister. You know, she gave me my first copy of, uh, of a Stephen King book, which was Salem's Lot when I was oh. a teenager. And, uh, and, uh, she would, um, uh, tell me the movies that she would go see. She's like eight years older than me. So, so she was, and then the next morning I would sit in her room and she would tell me the beat for beat, the story of the exorcist. And I was, oh my God, what is this magical thing? And I remember her doing that with Parallax View and being so, what do you mean he dies at the end? There's okay, so I just watched I, that a few months ago. Yeah. I'd it's never a great seen movie. it. I'd oh. never seen it. Caught it on TCM. Somehow yeah. or another, I'd never seen it. Sorry, you were saying it's the great, Exorcist. Yeah, so though, though, but she sort of introduced me to a lot of that, uh, those stories that became iconic. It, yeah, they, hey, I have one of those that Gary Tunnicliffe made me. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Because he did he 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 did the effects on um, on uh, the uh, yes on the Rennie Harlan version. Yeah. Well, and he did the effects on your last movie too, right? Oh, Gary's done. I've worked with Gary since Dracula 2000. Well, the owners uh-huh. of a con actually sent this to me for my birthday the other day, and oh, uh, nice. You know, which, it was nice, but I I was looking, and my wife was like, "You're gonna bring that into the house?" <laughs> Azizu, of course. <laughs> I know. It's like right. a fertility de- demon. God, whatever. <laughs> now I got the one. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> you We're say good. that now. <laughs> a uh, lot I, of home time. I am, yeah, I know. But he's a toddler and I'm 42 and we're good. So uh, yeah. anyway, you were saying. But, so I got, I got to ask with your, with, your, with your sister telling you frame by frame what happened in The Exorcist, how did that impact you when you actually first saw it for the first time? That's a good, yeah. Well, you know, it's like it already had a running commentary of it in my head. And, it, it, you know, I, I, I love that film. I still, you know, I remember I didn't see it till I was like 18 or 19. That's about um, time when I saw it. Yeah. And with that bushy like, beard bastard. Oh, oh. <laughs> really? I was the first one to show it to you. Yeah. My parents, I'm sorry, Patrick. My parents went no. to the when I was 11. And uh, the next year, my mom showed it to me. I was been 12. Wow. Probably explains a lot. She was going through a lot too. She yeah. That was well, the time I get show. that. You know, it's the it's about a family in crisis. It sure is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it makes whatever crisis you're going in seem a little less. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't all. think my 11, 12 year old brain quite grabs that. But yeah, I enjoyed it. Well, looking back now, you can appreciate it all the more for right. for that 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 gentle gift your mother gave you. I, I do want to say the scarier parts now as an older man are the oh. hospital scenes which bothered a lot of people when i was oh. a child didn't scare me now probably scares yeah. me more. yeah the, it's it's a horror movie from frame one and it's it's the greatest example of a beautiful slow burn mm-hmm. yes right it is an hour before shit starts getting really crazy and yes. and in that hour you're just so uncomfortable and and it's making the world utterly real yeah um, you know, it's making you believe it the way the character believes it. It's it's a real great example of storytelling. Of course, you know, what do they shoot? 200, 212 days. Uh, you know, now you're lucky to get 20. Yeah. Uh, uh, and they and they shot in Iraq, <laughs> and, you know, which is uh, amazing. For uh, a month, correct? Yeah, I think shot so. In and they, for, and for the month. Frozen, I think on the Frozen set, the refrigerated set, I think they shot in that for something like 60 days. Yeah, I read his autobiography a couple of, uh, last year or the year before, and it was fascinating. Yeah, I would bet. I would bet. Yeah, if you get that. a chance, because you forget there was a couple of turkeys before the French Connection. Oh, uh, yeah, and then a few after The Exorcist, although Sorcerer I love. Uh-huh. Sorcerer is an amazing film that I didn't discover till I was in my thirties because it's hard to discover. Yeah, to there's find. a great Blu-ray version of it out now. Yeah, that's what yeah. I have. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, that is where madness and filmmaking meet. Yeah, and and you know I had a wonderful chance, you know, in 2001 to work with Roy Scheider for a day and uh, have dinner with him afterwards and talk to him about that and all that jazz. He's not a big didn't discuss Jaws a lot, but certainly that film and and uh, and all that jazz. Uh, he was much more interested. In. Yeah, it's pretty pretty fantastic. Well, I'd imagine if you've been asked about Jaws for every day of your life. Yeah, I yeah. would have brought up Romeo is bleeding. I didn't bring that up. Yeah, no, it was you know 
dinner wasn't very long. <laughs> he was up. flying out the next morning yeah. Yeah. from Romania. <laughs> yeah. Another another really good film was Fifty Two Pickup with him. Fifty Two Pickup's great. John Frankenheimer, yeah. The Fourth War. If you've ever seen that Frankenheimer film. Mm. Oh no, I haven't. I need to. You should check it out. It is it is um, a, a end of the Cold War movie, and it's uh, uh, basically along the border. Uh, Roy Scheider and Jurgen Prochnow as this uh, Russian, his Russian counterpart as these two uh -huh. old Cold Warriors who have no purpose anymore. Yeah. Start a fight. Oh. And it, it is. It's great. Yeah. It's a, a very simple, it's 90 minutes, Frankenheimer again, you know, same director to pick up. And, yep. yeah, oh, I'm, I'm familiar weird. with Frankenheimer. Well, there's a, there's yeah. several people that say 52 pickup is like one of three or four films that uh, Joachim Golan and Globus made out of, uh, that made the whole time that are good movies out of. Uh, well, I have to confess my favorite of their movies is Life Force. Um, so, <laughs> you picked up the extended Blu-ray, <laughs> the new one. Of course, well, of I course. Someone I, was, I was really hoping you were going to say Firewalker. Now I'm just disappointed. <laughs> oh, it's not Firewalker. It's not even Runaway Train. But, uh, well, that's the other but one. But Life Force, Life Force is inspired. Oh, yes. It's, <laughs> in, it's in something. every way. Have you ever read the book by Colin Wilson, The Space Vampire? No, I haven't, but I've never read it. I've read others of his. Uh, okay, so I, I tried that. reading it and got bored halfway through it. There, there was yeah. a broken chair over here. It's gone now that that book kept up for many, many years, and I never finished it. So, so it served a purpose. Yeah, I never, <laughs> never got to meet Toby, but um, that I met him. I met him at Wes's at Wes's memorial. Oh, did you? Yeah, and I remember telling him how much I liked Life Force. Oh, thank you. He was very, very appreciative of that because, you know, Life Force. Well, the three movies that they say that are good, and we need to get back to your career, but I'm having a good time talking to you about movies. I hope you're enjoying this, too. Oh, absolutely. Our, sure. our, is is um, 52 Pickup, um, a, uh, hold on, hold on, what was the other one? Runaway Train and Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Yeah. Is that I don't know if made that were the three good canon films? And Life Force. Okay, yeah, they don't usually bring up life force. So no Firewalker, no Cobra? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's okay. So well, let's get back. So it takes balls of steel. How did you do? Did you go to film school? This, there's a couple. Um, you know, I tried to get into the Simon Fraser uh, University Film School, uh, which is in Vancouver, and uh, uh, tried twice. And they told me my interests were too commercial that I, I uh, that uh, basically uh, at the time, so this was in uh, 82 and 83, that they were looking for uh, people who wanted to make experimental films or, you know, great Canadian documentaries. Mm -hmm. um, and you had to write an essay on, on, on a film that inspired you. So the first time I applied, I wrote my essay on Blade Runner. The second time I wrote it on The Thing, on Carpenter's The Thing. <laughs> Neither time did I get in. Um, well, let me, but you had a good time the summer of 82, didn't you? 82 was amazing. It's kind uh, of crazy that in 82, 83, a, a, a film school was wanting to go in the art direction. Well, this was before Vancouver really had the big film boom there, oh, right? Yeah. So where people were, it was a skill. So that's the, so I ended up going to what was then called Capilano College, which had what, what they called a media resources program. Uh, they now have a big film program at now our university, um, and they they put a lot of their students into the into the film community in Vancouver, and, and they're they're very aggressive in commercial filmmaking. Uh, what they teach there, um, and Cap was Capilano was great because uh, the media resources was basically designed to to teach you how to work in an AV department at like a college or university, but what they had was equipment. So me and uh, several of the other people in there, we started using the equipment for anything we could do. We shot industrials, we shot, you know, just jobs on the side, anything, you know, if somebody had 150 bucks, you know, it's enough to pay for a three quarter inch tape or, or film or whatever, then we would go off and, and shoot whatever, kids circus, reading videos, didn't matter what it was. Um, and, uh, and then that was, became the advent of electronic editing. So once I finished that, um, there was a show uh, uh, happening in town called uh, Hamilton's 
Quest, which is a little Vancouver show. And those editors, I started volunteering on that. I would go in in the morning at 6 a.m. to help them load dailies on something called a Montage One, which was 17 uh, Betamax decks queued together. And you would take a, a half hour program divided into two parts and you would save it on Bernoulli's, which are these huge drives. Uh, and you'd have three Bernoulli's per part and the tapes would shuttle and queue up to be able to play a segment. Um, it was a strange thing, but I you know, learned how to use that. And then they went on to The Hitchhiker, which was the, one of the first original HBO shows, which is basically Yuppies Run Amok. Yeah, um, right. You know, and, uh, but they had directors like, you know, Philip Noyce and Carl Schenkel and, and Colin Buxy and, and all sorts of different people and, and all sorts of, you know, uh, Bill Paxton and Bud Court were in one of the ones that I worked on, um, uh, where they both played, uh, one was a guy who, who, who poisoned milk, uh, and the other was a, was a guy who killed the convenience store clerks and they and they basically start yeah they kill each other at the end it was quite fun um uh, but uh from that then it led to was an assistant editor on 21 jump street the original at the beginning of the fox network right. remember seeing the dailies of jeff yeager in the johnny depp part before they fired him and replaced him with johnny depp because they shot for like 10 days oh really? uh, i don't know that i knew that I didn't yeah know that jeff yeager in in that part uh, and you know, even the old Frederick Forrest was the police captain for for before Stephen Williams replaced him after uh -huh. episode five because they found Mr. Forrest to be challenge. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, and then from that, you know, did a few other things and and then got to be an assistant editor on on MacGyver and yep, then saw that. and then from MacGyver uh, moved up to editing on MacGyver. Started editing when I was twenty four. Uh, uh, two days after my son was born. Okay. Uh, and uh, cut MacGyver for three years, and that ended, and then that gave me a chance to work on a little pilot for Philip Noyce called uh, uh, Nightmare Cafe, which Wes Craven wrote and uh, produced, and uh, Wes was doing people, people under the stairs at the time the pilot was shot, so he didn't direct the pilot. Uh -huh. So uh, we came back to do five episodes, and I cut Wes's episode and he and I got along great and then he asked me to cut his next feature which was Wes Craven's New Nightmare two years uh -huh. later we stayed in touch and then I moved to California Wes helped sponsor my family to move down we moved down to California and, and cut Wes Craven's New Nightmare and, uh, and then the rest is history yeah uh, Vampire in Brooklyn and, and then ultimately Scream and all sorts of things so chad i'm sure you've got several so you have a similar background to us the only difference is is the career so there wasn't a film department <laughs> in eastern kentucky well, yeah. you know I, I gotta tell this story because it's kind of funny um when we the college we went to when they were teaching us editing mm -hmm. um it was tape to tape strictly real to real um and the example that they showed us on how to edit was old macgyver footage <laughs> we don't know how the man we i don't know how our instructor got it but wow. it, it was macgyver running through a forest talking to an indian using using language like hand language to talk to him uh, i think it was like a uh, smoke walker and then he, he he had all this raw footage of macgyver and we had to edit the sequence on how we thought it would be so <laughs> oh wow that's fantastic I don't remember that you don't remember that at all yeah, was really? that real um, there was a, it, it was a, it was a Creekmore class. Creekmore sorry, you have no. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fantastic. Some hey, yeah, I, I, some I, of these people I, are dead now. So yeah. And and, and because I'm a, <laughs> and, and because I'm a huge TV and and movie nerd, I actually um, after class because I you know my teacher would let me hang out after class. I would actually go and find all the MacGyver because he had a stockpile of this raw MacGyver footage. And I was fascinated. I would actually just watch the raw cuts of just take after take after take. <laughs> Where would he oh, have that's fantastic. Where would he have gone? I, um, I know a lot of the dailies were donated because we had, because we were cutting on the montages, you uh -huh. had to load them all into, off a of three quarter. So you had, we, yeah. there was. And that's what we had was three quarter stacks and stacks at three quarters. Uh, I remember donating all the ones from Jump Street to uh to capilano uh college during my time there 
Uh, and so MacGyver would have been donated in a similar fashion. Okay. And then somehow it managed, it managed to be in an Eastern Kentucky college. <laughs> well, things travel. Somebody might have traded it for something. <laughs> and it's a small world, like we were talking about Todd, yeah. going through, you know, yeah. you know, four, then you meet five. And yeah, so yeah. somebody out of there knew somebody and then got it donated back. That's fascinating. Oh, that's great. But we have an intro, we have the same background. There wasn't really film there, but there we had access to a little bit of equipment and we did things on the side. You're it's almost the same story. Yeah, because it was, oh. uh, you, you know, for me, it was, uh, you know, uh, not to go into too much personal detail with, with me because we want to hear about you. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, when I went to college, I had two options. Um, I could go to a university that actually had a movie that got released. Um, and John Carpenter went there for a brief period. Um, but it was two years before you ever touched equipment. Oh. Or I could go to this small little college in Eastern Kentucky where I could automatically get into the program and start messing with equipment right away. So, well, that's great. Yeah, I, that's I, I just couldn't, I yeah. couldn't justify because I'd already spent four years messing with video equipment and editing, which is yeah. my passion anyway. I love editing. So, um, Chad, yeah. out of the two of us, I would rather shoot and he would rather edit. I'm a huge editor. I love editing. You yeah, me too. I, I, it was my first love editing, and I, I still love doing it. And, and uh, movies are and movies are made in the cutting room. Uh, yes, they can be made uh, or destroyed or saved in the cutting room. Yes, yeah. all those things can happen. All the movies are made in the cutting room. I know yeah. there's many, many, many different layers. I mean, if the script sucks, if the shooting sucks, I understand. But movies yeah. are made in the cutting. I, I worked for a producer years ago who, who said, you know, a, a great DP can make your movie look beautiful and an editor can save your picture. Right. So. Wait, and I got I to gotta ask, just because you're an editor, have you ever edited any of the, out of the 30 movies you've edited? Have, or one well, you haven't, but TV too. Have you ever seen a trailer for your movie? and they used all of your best cuts. <laughs> You're like, you ruined the whole thing. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. With, 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 with rage. Yeah. 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 No, it, it's uh, certainly, I, I remember the trailer for Drive Angry um, calling up the head of marketing at Summit and, and just protesting and it's like, you, 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 you make the, you know, the character dumb that she hasn't figured it out because you've told everybody everything. And, and they were like, you know, I think we know a thing or two about marketing and you don't know anything. Uh, I might have said, uh, if it wasn't for the Twilight movies, uh, nothing you've marketed could be successful, ha has been successful. <laughs> Um, and even the Hurt Locker, what it wasn't a big money. Anyway, I said a lot of things I probably should know. So this, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, um, needless to say, uh, yeah, uh, that's one. Of, that's one of my biggest kicks about going to of, of seeing a trailer and then going to a movie and realizing they put every single good cut into uh, the trailer, and I'm like, I know that's driving the editor crazy. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's a thing <laughs> for you. Just so like you know that that was that that was some of the nice things about the screen movies as they went. The the trailers were very careful about mm -hmm. not revealing, you know, the reveals for the movie, and and uh, I, 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 that was a big thing on because of that on Valentine. Uh, you know, the first still they released on Valentine was Jensen in the miner's outfit underneath like a fan or something covered in blood. And I just thought, what? You can't release that still. And <laughs> and and I was. They sent me that on an email chain, um, which had every executive and everybody on it. And I responded with like huge panic. And uh, and suddenly it was a very small chain. But they they were actually really good about it. Once they realized that marketing just didn't know. They had no idea. Right. And I said, and then I was just like, you guys need to see the movie. Let's watch the movie right away. And they set up, they came in and watched the film and suddenly they were like, okay, we get your concern. Let's make an adjustment. We'll make sure that's not an issue. And luckily it wasn't, but it was the, the panic when I first saw that was immense. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, they were, they were, they, Lionsgate was great. Uh, I, I, you know, back then I, I haven't worked for them for since that, but they were wonderful to work with them at the time. So, why was there not a sequel? I know you've several times. 
because it was a it was a number one hit. It was a huge movie. It made well, once again uh, it was it there made over a hundred million worldwide. It made them a fortune. It helped keep them uh, alive when uh, Carl Icahn was trying to buy them. Yep. And um, they had said if the movie hadn't performed over the weekend that the Lionsgate wouldn't exist the next week. Yep. Wow. Um, but you know what happened was there was a we were very lucky we got to make it at all. Uh, our big champion there was Mike Pasternak, uh, who also was an executive on the original. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason they took the I from Paramount when that was being a pro, you know sort of a problematic film uh, was because he wanted to get Valentine. Uh -huh. um, and then there was a management shift. Um, they wanted to get in, you know, they made movies like uh, Killers with uh, Ashton Kutcher, mm -hmm. you know, which was a very expensive sort of thing. And then Next Three Days with Russell Crowe, which was sort of a big expensive thing. And it wasn't until they really found their footing again with Hunger Games um, uh, that they sort of came back out of that little slump that they went into. Um, but Valentine, uh, we were told what was one of the descriptions somebody said this is like a a blunt blow to the face why would we make this this is one of the new uh people in charge um and so this is when we we're trying to make the original and mike was so savvy uh with how he did it you see he he i came in one day we were worried about doing it, it was during the writer's strike in 2007 Mm -hmm. um, uh, and he was like, I need you to, and they had signed on first. They had made a deal first so we could actually start doing a uh, revision on the script. Um, so they were, he was like, I need you to meet, uh, a dog. Uh, and then I need you to cast Selena Luna, who is uh, a little person in a, a vaudeville, a, a burlesque actress, mm -hmm. right. uh, in the movie. And I was just like, sure can we kill her and then he was like sure um uh now come meet the dog and the dog needs to like you and i was just like okay and so went down and and met lewis the dog that she has in the movie who belonged to one of the heads of marketing oh and, and the other head of marketing um was a huge fan of selling this. um and so because we put them in the film marketing got completely behind the project and that because marketing went to the heads of the of Lionsgate and said we can sell this film um and if we it, you know because because of those two people that scene in the in the motel where you see them coming out the 3d shot of the dog coming up and selling or running up in her little cowboy boots afterwards that if it was not for that scene that movie would exist that is an amazing <laughs> story. Yeah, that's a great story. Uh, it, yeah. I, so, so they even after all the money, though, I just don't understand. You would think it's after a, all the money. They just, uh, you know, we we wrote Todd and I wrote a whole scriptment for a sequel. Uh, we had it all sort of laid out. Um, all the actors, Jensen and Kerr and Jamie and Eddie Gathegi, were all willing to come back. We had good roles for all of them in it. Um, uh, and, uh, Mike kept going back to them saying, Hey, we should make this now's the time. And every year they're like, no, no, no. And, 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 you know, it's, it's it, been over 12 years now. So and you obviously know the business more than me. And I, and I, I did, didn't mean to harp. That may not, that may not be true, but yeah. Well, no, you do. <laughs> but it's one of those where movies who make half as much money are the sequel is greenlit the next weekend. Oh yeah. After oh yeah. Half as oh yeah. It 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 didn't make any sense to to us, especially given the fact that you know uh, the cast, uh, Jensen in particular, right? Jensen, you know, it, it, he they're finally finishing Supernatural. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, he wanted to come back. He wanted to do it, and, and it's just like even if we only had him, um, but all of them wanted to be part of it and and it wouldn't have cost a lot more money we, you know we had a whole plan for it and um a fun little story and a fun fun way to still keep the minor in it and 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 uh tom you know jensen's character in it um, yeah. but uh they 
uh, weren't buying it. I've heard rumors that they're they're planning to reboot it and hiring other people or something like that. But I don't right. I don't know if that's true either. Uh, but I've heard that. Right. Yeah, because I will give you one other compliment. Uh, out of the two boys from that one little show that you're talking about, Jensen made the good movie. Yes. Yes, I I, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, I, I did see both movies. Obviously, I saw yes. that Jensen's and. Uh, um, we just had a lot of fun with it. And I mean, it was brutally hard, that film, because, you know, shooting, because we shot native 3D. We'd never done it before. Um, the camera rigs were built the day before we started shooting. Almost every day of photography, they were saying, wow, this has never been done before. Um, you know, you were shooting a movie with a camera that was the size of a refrigerator. Yeah. Um, so you weren't very mo mobile. You could maybe average 17 setups a day, maybe. Um, so it was a lot of long hours and we had a hard out on Jensen. Jensen had to be finished and back in Vancouver for Supernatural on a certain date and any day late would cost our production $200,000. Wow. So we had to shoot six day weeks. We had to shoot like, you know, 15, 16, 17 hour days. It was, it was, uh, an ex I remember finishing that show in like tears and being delirious, like not like I had hallucinated for a week and a half afterwards because I, I couldn't tell. I, I would try to sleep and people were like putting up lights inside the room I was sleeping in. I was always in the way. It was a, <laughs> it was a very strange experience, but I wouldn't have traded it for anything. It was it was a great it was uh, it was I look back on it with great fondness. You, you answered one half of my question, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask this first okay. half of this. When you, when you originally got on for My Bloody Valentine, was it always intention to be 3D? Was, your, was that always your intention to make it 3D or did that come uh, later? What, what happened was it, it started with, hey, um, I was showing, because I recut and, you know, uh, wrote uh, uh, and, uh, and directed 40 pages of reshoots for the eye, the Jessica Alba film. Right. Because uh, it was fairly problematic um, <laughs> oh that's um, a better story for that you, yeah um you talk more about that yeah well yeah uh but one of the days i came in to show the cut there peter block and and uh and mike it was the day they closed the rights for valentine oh wow okay. and they and they were like hey do you want to direct my bloody valentine i was like absolutely i totally do uh and i i had seen it years ago but the cut version uh you know the version i've been that had been censored yeah. that cut um, but it was a Canadian, one of the Canadian tax shelter slasher movies. So yep. I, I, I knew it well. And, uh, uh, and then probably about two or three weeks after that, they were like, Hey, do you want to do it in 3d? I was like, absolutely. I know nothing about 3d, but I'll learn. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we shot some 3d tests. We met with all the different 3d companies. Um, we heard about this strange movie called avatar that had was shooting and was still shooting and was plagued by nothing but problems uh, with uh, right. their 3D. Um, and we decided that wouldn't be us. Um, and it wasn't, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we managed to uh, do what we thought we would do and what we set out to do um, in a pretty timely fashion. But, that, but that's how the 3D happened because I didn't realize at the time, but Mike was battling the studio and just making the movie at all. So the 3D and then the dog and, the, and, and Sel Selena Luna uh, were all part of what got us to make the film. Right. Uh, you know, that, that trifecta is how uh, marketing was going to uh, sell the film. Well, so as an editor and being trained as an editor before you direct, yeah. how much more efficient does that make you as a director, knowing where you need to go get the shot and how much, I'm sure that, and we we didn't talk about Dracula two thousand. We've not talked about some other films too. You directed many things before this, right? But we're yeah. just on this movie particular. How efficient it, it was invaluable because you 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 know no part of the animal is wasted. Right, you, right. You, everything you get you have to use. Um, that was even more so for Drive Angry uh, than than Valentine. Um, but we you know you just there was no time to second guess things that's the biggest thing that editing allows you to do it's just like this is the coverage we need this is you know once you work out the blocking you can very quickly see the pieces that you need to put it together 
Right, right. Um, so, um, and it's always, you know, every time I direct it, it's always um, on any given day, because you get less and less days to shoot anything, you have to think, okay, what's the minimum I need to get to walk away with this? You know, to have something that tells the story that's malleable afterwards. Right. Uh, and then how in each moment can I enhance that uh, you know, cause you're, every day's, uh, you're playing beat the clock. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that becomes the combination and being from editing allows you to play beat the clock better. Yeah. That's really what it does. Sorry, Chad. I thought you were going to ask something. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, why was it, why was it even more valuable in drive angry? Well, drive angry was, it, it's interesting to be, you know, drive angry. We had, uh, five more days of shooting than we had on Valentine. Um, but our daily time restrictions were worse. Uh, we could only shoot, we, we, we had what you call 12 hours portal to portal for the crew, uh, for everybody. So uh, uh, Nick was great, Nick Cage was great because he would, you know, he would come in early, he would stay late. He didn't, he was just, he loved the film and he was on board. So whatever we needed. But because we were a road picture shooting in Shreveport, most of the stuff we were shooting out of town. Yeah. So we, so if it takes you an hour, hour and a half to get there, right? So that, so you've just lost three hours from your shooting day. Right. So, and then, so 12 hours portal, portal meant that we were lucky to get nine hours of shooting a day. Yeah. So hour per hour, Drive Angry versus versus uh, Valentine, we had 10 less hours of shooting uh, or whatever uh, on Drive Angry for what was uh, a bigger film uh, in scope and scale. And, and uh, so er everything had to be planned down to what we were doing and then, and how we were gonna make that work. And, uh, and then the other thing that we had on that is we had 17 days of a second unit to help us with some car stuff that Johnny Martin directed. Um, but we only have one set of lenses between the two units. And it takes a certain amount of time to change the 3D lenses. And you have to have, like, because you're shooting native 3D, you need a pair of lenses that are exactly the same. Oh, so wow. they have to be calibrated the same, they have to be put on the cameras and registered correctly. Um, so the lenses that you were shooting on any given camera that day are the lenses you're shooting with for that day. Right. Um, so we had to plan what they were shooting and what we were shooting and how we could swap cameras between the two units. Um, so it was a real navigation to of limited resources to maximize uh, our output, what we were getting. So that was the real, the real reason for that. I, I have no background as an editor. I am the exception <laughs> to that rule. I, I did have a question though, because you've written and directed your, your, yes. what you've written. What is that process like? Does, do things change as you, as you try to make the film from the director viewpoint? Do you have to kind of store the writer mentality? Oh, yeah, that's a good just... point because those are three different hats. And if you wrote it and you directed it and you edited it, which you've done with several movies, yeah. Which, uh, I, which, what happens as a writer as you the different hats that you have to put on because they're three different disciplines. Yeah, I you know I've done a lot of writing with Todd, so Todd occasionally uh, uh, gets frustrated with me because I my goal is always to any scene that feels like it might need explanation later, because um, he'll like well we can just cut it, cut that out we can trim that down we may not need that it's just like fix it I'd in rather, post. I well and my philosophy is always I'd rather see them say it. I'd rather have shot them saying it. I'd rather shoot a scene that was three pages longer to have more of the dialogue on camera than less of it and want it later and have to do it with ADR. Yep. So that, um, that becomes the hazard of the writing is, is he would cut stuff, which were good cuts, and I'd be like, no, oh, no, 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 we have to put that back. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. We might want to, we might want to see them say it. And, and then there would be also little directorial things where you're like, we should leave that in there. We need to shoot this. And it's just like, well, what that would be there? What would that be for? And it's like, I don't know. Editorially later, I think we might want that. I'm not sure. And we'll figure it out, but we should get that because that might be some sort of glue that's, that's, that's important. So that's, you know, 
that that's um, the it's really the editorial brain drives everything because that's the one that has to that has to pick up the pieces at the end right so yeah. every thought in the writing process and the directing process is all about the editing right I said ask that question because I know some people that are writers that have their work adapted uh, some come back later and say I don't know why they didn't just use what I put on the page so I just wanted to ask as somebody that's done all of it from from start to finish yeah what that I, looks like. I, I never feel that so much as a when I've directed the things that I've written the things I've written that have been directed by others I totally feel that <laughs> <laughs> Terminator I absolutely feel that oh my god you Fuckers, what did you do that for? We'll um, get to Terminator in a second. <laughs> uh, oh, hang on one second. I'm just going to turn on a light just because the, the light is fading. The legs. I mean, you're not my type, but Andy left. Oh, I just oh, like to back. Oh, there. Here, I'm back. Hey, we, we, <laughs> just, hey, we, we were sitting here. We're, we're straight, yeah. but we were enjoying the show of your legs. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so back to... And then this is going to sound disrespectful. I don't mean it. Well, I shouldn't say no, no. But Chris Alexander is an also fellow Canadian. He uh, edited Feng Fango uh, after Tony mm. Tempone for many, many years. And Fantastic. we've had, well, that's okay. We've had several different people on the show. And we always, when we I have, have Fango's right there, with, who's <laughs> worked with Nick Cage, we always say, what's your best batshit Nick Cage story? And his is the best. So if you don't mind, what's your, and by the way, our friend James here, we all love Nick. But James, I was going to say, you've actually worked with my triumvirate of people that I would love to see just thrown into a film together. Uh, oh, who? With Cursed. Cursed, you had Christina Ricci, right? Um, who was my, uh, growing up, she's about my same age, and I, fo I followed her career with interest. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, Christopher Walken. Yep. Um, oh, Prophecy. Yeah. And, and Nick Cage. And I, that's, that's, I, so. Uh, I, I, that's I, a trifecta. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, I, I that's, love that's like, and I, I actually appreciate. It. I was I was telling somebody the other day. I think Drive Angry now. Nick Cage is doing more horror films. Mandy, yeah. and Mom and Dad, and I'm like, but you have got to go back and watch Drive Angry. So you, I'm like, it's it this great progression as he eases into horror from you know working with Sharon stuff. Uh, yeah, well, it, Nick, I remember the day we were shooting uh, the opening uh, where he shoots off the guy's hand. Yeah, right. right. And Nick and I said, you know, and then his hand blows off. We had this rig that Gary Tunnicliffe had made that actually fired air in the hand, blew off uh, of this uh, of of the of the stunt guy. And and Nick was just like, what are you doing to me? Uh, I I may never get to do a family movie again. It's just like, dude, this isn't Family Man Two. You knew it when you signed on. <laughs> um, but I, I I found Nick to be fantastic. He he was. He was always very uh, on top of the character. Probably the, the craziest bit was, was him in pre-production wanting to shave his head and tattoo, really tattoo, uh, smoke and flames all across his skull um, and, and, and telling the producers that. And they were like, you have to talk about it. We, we can't do that. And, and tell him it's too late. Bam, bam, Bigelow already did it. Well, this was <laughs> back in 2000, 2010. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so, but, but, you know, and Nick was, he didn't care that the producers didn't want that. He didn't really care about the bond company, but the thing that made him decide not to do it when we were talking about it was, um, because, because the producers were all afraid to talk to him. So, so no, you have to talk to him. I'm, we're not talking to him. <laughs> Um, and, and, and Nick's told this story on, 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 uh, the tonight show or something like that. So he won't mind that I'm telling it. Um, but the thing that got him to, to back off of it was, I just said, if you look like that on the side of the road, Piper, which is Amber Heard's character, she does not let you in the car. Oh yeah. And, this and that was the thing he said, Oh, you're right. Okay. No, I won't do it. By the way, it's fascinating to me that he was worried about not doing any family films after that picture. <laughs> but he also went, you know what I need to do? Is just, was oh, yes. Head. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we all have a duality. Yeah. Well, no, and, and, and I love, uh, and that's what I always tell people is I love uh, every Nick Cage film I've ever seen because I'm like, I am going to have an experience. 
Yeah, and, yeah. And any film that I watch with him, actually one of my favorite um, the Scorsese film he did, uh, Bring Out the Dead. Bring Out the Dead. Yes. I, uh, I, I, I saw that movie once. I used to have a job where I was on call and responded to emergencies and stuff. And I, I was on call when I watched it. I was allowed to, you know, I had to answer the phone if it rang or something. But I had actually been on for a few days and, and that movie just immediately synced with me. And I later on, I went, I bought a copy. I have DVD shelves over here. And uh, the I was checking out and the guy was like, are you sure you want this movie? And I'm like, I love this movie. He goes, you're the one. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> I'm the other anyway, one. So I, I bought the copy the next day too. I, uh, uh, I, I do. Uh, so I wanted to ask about uh, Nick Cage and, and, and also I did want to see um, what is Christopher Walken like? <laughs> Working Chris, with Chris oh my is, God, the, that's the the most cliche question ever. No, I, but no, what's, yeah, what's Chris it, is great. Is Christopher, you know? is Christopher Walken just smell nice? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've heard he smells like apples. Is that true? true? I can actually answer that question, but I'm not going to. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> really? Oh, dude! There goes um, our exclusive. Uh, we're always know. looking for an exclusive. You know, we're huge Christopher Walken fans. Oh, I, I Chris is he's wonderful and and very. You know, I found it to be very kind and, and and smart and and experimental. You know, he's definitely you know uh, uh, comes out of the seventies and and uh, uh, he would have you know we would rehearse and stuff like that. And it was the first film I'd ever directed. So yeah, I was going to say cause that's that's yeah, a big oh. that's a big thing going your first movie ever directed and yeah, it's and he's an Academy Walker. right, and it, and he was doing sleepy Hollow. he had just finished or it's just going off wow. to do sleepy wow. hollow yeah um at the time so he had done his head cast and he had told them they, they had to build him a mechanical horse because after heaven's gate he said he would never go on a horse again <laughs> um uh, although apparently he's a very good very good rider but he 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 wouldn't do that um and uh he was very he had a lot of fun with the you know as he called them his angel movies and uh uh, but he would do things where he would like, okay, maybe in this version of the scene we're rehearsing, and it was a very sort of, uh, you know, um, newly uh, inexperienced actress who was lovely, and she was, she was, uh, and he's like, I'm going to do it where I don't say anything, and so she would say her line, and he wouldn't say anything. He would just be like, and 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 then she would, and we were outside. It was in the morning. It was freezing cold, and she she was just like. I don't know what to do if he doesn't speak. <laughs> and and so Chris was just like, I'll say the lines, don't worry. Um, but you know, you meet Chris at the beginning and he, he has already taken all the punctuation out of the script. He rewrites all the dialogue, takes all the punctuation out. Right. And, uh, and then he just, uh, you, you know, you have like a two hour tea with Christopher Walken. That's how you, that, that's how you start the process. So that I, sounds I have, both amazing and terrifying. Well, we were in a, we ended up being in a room was in the afternoon, so nobody else was in this sort of lounge. But some guy came in in the back of the lounge and started playing the piano. And Chris turned and looked at him and said, "I'm gonna go smash that guy's head in the keyboard." He's just playing because he wants me to hear him. And it's just like I'm gonna, I'm gonna smash his fingers in that keyboard. <laughs> and uh, I can't do a good Christopher Walken, unfortunately. Years ago, I could sort of do it, but that's it's faded. Um, but he uh, and ultimately he did not. Uh, but he laughed when he said it, uh, which might have been scarier. Um, yeah. But yeah. Chris is great. You know, we we offered the role of Van Helsing in Dracula 2000 to Chris first. Oh. Um, oh really? I called, I called him up and sent him the script, and and he was like. You know, I like this, but uh, I'm trying to be Fred McMurray. Uh, <laughs> um, he wants to do the Shaggy Dog. Yeah, and he did, and yeah, and and he did um, uh, Kangaroo Kid and stuff like that. So, oh, uh, Kangaroo, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It didn't work. <laughs> yeah, didn't but work. but he but he well, and he also did Blast from the Past yeah. and okay. stuff like that. He wanted to do more of those kind of films at that time. I think he wanted to broaden his 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 audience base and not be considered quite so strange um but uh you know eventually the the work that calls you calls you and 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 you respond to the side yeah yeah uh, there's probably a good reason i did yeah, <laughs> I, I would have looked and said can we get billy wilder fred mcmurray and not the shaggy dog fred that's that's that that's the fred mcmurray so but that's yeah he wanted to he wanted to be fred mcmurray yeah. um so that was you know that was a uh, that 
was a, f a fun conversation with him. But, uh, but you took a good bounce from that. It's not like the person who played the role didn't do a good job. Now, I don't oh, know no, no. Was... Chris, Christian Plummer was great. And, yeah, and Plummer Chris... was, uh, he was, he was a, a joy to work with. You know, he was 72 at the time. So uh, we were making him an action hero, running around and shooting mm -hmm. vampires and doing all sorts of things. Um, you know, he, he originally had quite a different death scene that the studio, the pro, one of the challenges with Dracula 2000 was, was uh, when we were making it, we had a pretty decent script in April. Uh -huh. um, we had original script that was like a lean $8 million sort of, uh, uh, this was a story about thieves stealing Dracula's body from Van Helsing and selling the blood for immortality. That was the concept. Uh -huh. um, and then that got changed and changed and changed and changed and the thing just sort of got bloated and strange and, 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 and uh, uh, because it took so long to cast Dracula, we you know the script sort of got destroyed by the time we started shooting it suddenly the thieves had no idea what they were stealing or why they were stealing it uh johnny lee miller's character who was the protege vampire hunter to van helsing in the beginning the role he signed on to play suddenly was just an antique stealer his line about never fuck with an antique stealer in that movie was johnny's joke because the fact that his character had changed so much uh, <laughs> uh and he would say it on set all the time as a joke that's just like we're gonna put it in the movie um uh, you know, I remember the, the Weinstein saying to me at one time, you know, it's, it's, it, it's our movie. You do what we tell you when it's your movie, you can do what you want. Uh, and just being, you know, hanging your head every day as you went in to sort of manage this, this train trundling down the tracks. Um, well, I mean, yeah. Wes, Wes had their, Wes had his problems with them too. Oh, Wes did, uh, Del Toro did. You know, I cut Mimic for Guillermo Del Toro. That oh. was, you, you always know you're in trouble when you see on the call sheet day 79 of 50. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, that, that, that film was, I, I, you know, there's one scene in that film that I think has nine directors and you Mimic? can look at it yeah. shot per shot. Yeah. Uh, wow. Have you, uh, have you ever looked at the well you looked at all the footage but i have <laughs> i'm so sorry i was about to say have you seen the directors but i was like you've seen i have the yeah footage i didn't mean to be insulting yeah but the uh, the cut that he cut back yeah uh, and uh, you're right i mean so uh rodriguez directed on it who else uh ola bornadol uh jj authors uh uh rick boda yeah. Uh, some of them I can't remember their names. There's some Canadian second unit guys. Oh wow. Um, uh, but yeah, there was. I, do, uh, I, I a don't host of people. I know you said you didn't didn't have anything you didn't want to talk about, but I don't want to get too much into built uh, piling on and talking about Harvey. But I would like to ask a little bit about working in Dimension at that time because you you worked there a lot. A Dimension, yeah, and Dimension just. To be clear, Dimension was run by Bob. Bob, right. Right. Uh, um, Harvey would show up uh, at the previews. Mm -hmm. um, he would occasionally come into, he would come in and out of the, the meetings we would have after the previews and wave his cigarette around and almost poke your eyes out with it. Um, he, my involvement with Harvey was very limited over the years. Probably the show where I was around him, even on, on Music of the Heart. Um, I didn't have much to do with Harvey, but West had to battle Harvey on that. Yeah. You know, uh, Harvey sent his own versions of recutting music of the heart. West would just take it and throw it in the trash. Wouldn't even look at it. Um, and, uh, but, uh, we did a recut on 54 in about three weeks. Um, Harvey was, a, was around for the beginning of that three weeks. Then he left for vacation and Bob took over the finishing. Uh -huh. of the film with us because we we had just come off of uh, my editing team we just came off halloween h2o um and they put us on trying to uh recut 54 three weeks before it released well, um so you know uh my experience of harvey is limited my experience of bob is is a lot more um but neither uh, one of them were overly pleasant is that to be fair i mean well 
I, we have he, heard yeah, horror, yeah. so we had heard horror stories like yeah. everyone else, and yeah. we're so far removed from the industry. But Dimension was known for some horror stories and and some bad production. Oh yeah, yeah, and and those are those are true. Uh, you know, uh, and, any of this other you know, stuff. so that's what I'm more interested. I, you know, I do. Yeah. So, much so, about so you know, Harvey in his in his you know uh, in his crimes aside. Aside. That's yeah. Uh, you know, so um, as I said, my experience with Harvey was very limited. limited. And, right. Uh, and, and I don't always mean. just as an yeah, as an editor. Uh, you know, with Bob, there was you know we had a lot more contact with Bob. He would you know come to the cutting rooms. He would show up. He would. He would, you know, uh, keep pushing everybody in different directions. Sometimes he, you know, uh, as to what was, what he was looking for. Um, and that would change, you know. Uh, you know, Dracula 2000, one of the things I was starting to say before is because it was after, the year after uh, Columbine, mm -hmm. um, suddenly we would get, and they were going through all this sort of congressional stuff on violence uh post the the screen movies and um we there'd be scenes that we were ready to shoot van helsing's death in particular in drag day 2000 which we got the call the day beforehand what you're planning you have to stop you can't do that you know you can't do this you can't do that you, we don't even want you to shoot it you know it's so things would just so many things in that film just got thrown out before we even got to do it yeah. Um, or we did it and then that got thrown out because of, because of the political climate at the time, because they were in the middle of sort of running scared. Um, but yeah, they, there was a lot of, when you deal with people who, you know, sort of like our political challenges that we're dealing with right now, people who will react emotionally rather than logically, yep. rather than, and then you have a tendency to, to, be like you know uh, uh, an abused spouse in the relationship. Um, I know Wes frequently felt like that. I know uh, I know uh, Guillermo certainly felt like that. Uh, but I think other people, you know, there are other times when they can be incredibly rewarding. You know, I, I have to say my opportunity to direct came from Bob. You know, he gave me that opportunity because of of you know my whole directing career came out of uh cutting the first 13 minutes of screen yep um you know wes was going to get fired when they saw those dailies they hated those dailies bob yeah. hated them called him up and said he was like a like a journeyman tv director said he was a hack said you know wes had never been spoken to that way he was so mortified mm -hmm. um and you know he called me up and, and just said you know can you cut it together you know do you think there's something there i said what are you talking about this scene's going to be awesome yep. uh, you know, we cut it together, showed it to Wes. He had one music note. We conformed it on film. We sent it to New York and they called up to their credit. They, you know, Bob called them up and said, we were so wrong. Whatever you need, we'll give you. Okay. This absolutely works. So they could be, you know, Bob in Dimension could be very rewarding. You know, I had, you know, Andrew Rona, Richard Potter, uh, Carrie Granite, uh, Michael Zumas, you know, different guys who worked at, you know, Matt Signer, Keith mm -hmm. Levine, uh, uh, Matt Stein, all these guys who worked at Dimension over the years, I'm still friends with mm -hmm. and, and have tremendous respect for it because I think they were, those guys were living a nightmare scenario on the front line. Yeah. Right. I was, and I was in a cutting room or, you know, directing or whatever, you know, I was very removed from what was clearly a, a, a challenging is an understatement to call it. So this is a, this may be a little bit more in depth and I'm sorry if it is. Uh, so I kind of understand why you keep going back to dimension because you're looking for the opportunities. I give you an opportunity to direct and you get to do another movie and you get to do other movies. Right. Why do you think Wes did it? Other than the screen movies were very successful, but I mean, screen movies were very successful. Um, uh, for was, why cursed, why do cursed? Well, now there's an interesting story for that. Now, Wes was going to direct Pulse, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And he, they're very close to, to actually shooting Pulse. And something like eight weeks out, uh, Bob pulls the plug on Pulse. I don't want to make that. I don't want you to make that. I want you to make this script of Kevin Williamson's called Cursed. Wes was like, I don't want to make this movie. I made this movie. It was called Vampire in Brooklyn. I do not want to make it again. Yeah. I, uh, all, of all the challenges that were on Vampire in Brooklyn, 
you know, uh, Wes being dragged into Sherry Lansing's office and being told, you need to make it funny. You know, like Jack Nicholson in The Shining when he comes into the act saying, here's Johnny. It needs to be funny. <laughs> Sorry. And, and, and Eddie Wes, wanting to play it Wes, straight and scary, right? Right. And Wes saying to, to you know, Wes saying to, to the head of Paramount, do you understand you're telling me you want me to make it funny like The Shining? Do you understand that? Um, they didn't. Uh, um, and so that what Kus Kirsch was. But then what they did is they took the film he was going to make away from him. He had a whole crew looking to work that yep. suddenly all had jobs and all those jobs are gone. Right. Um, they probably doubled him the amount of money he was going to make. So they were very good at, at, at uh, 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 being the devil offering you, you know, here's, oh, yeah, here's, oh, yeah. here's a whole bunch of carrots that we know you might like. Why don't you come have these carrots? Uh, um, and they put you in a situation where you're like, fuck, I, 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 I am responsible for so many other people that I have to do this. I feel I have to do this. Now, you enter cursed with the best of intentions, right? You think, um, this is going to be okay. I'm going to come out the other side. I'm going to have... Um, so, cursed was a movie that they shot for something like 54 days. I came on it at the end. I was only supposed to be on it for six weeks because I was doing another project that, that then fell apart and then came on to edit. And uh, I was on cursed for 19 months. Um, and uh, they pulled the plug probably a week and a half before they finished shooting it. So they never shot the ending. Um, they shot the aftermath of the ending with Omar Epps and Robert Forster and, and uh, Scott Bio and everybody outside the Wax Museum, but they never shot the actual ending. Um, and, uh, and then we went on hiatus and started coming up with a new version of the movie. Kevin came back with a new thing. They shot for 40 some odd days. Um, and then, oh, that didn't work quite the way they wanted. And then we shot for like 17 days, the 13 days, the nine days. Um, you know, they say that movie cost $35 million. That movie cost almost a hundred million dollars. It had to have, it had to be. A yeah. Movie. And it, and it, of, of the original 54 days in the final film, there are only 12 minutes. Wow. Um, you know, so that should, that should tell you something. Um, but yeah. Again, you don't, you don't go into the film thinking, well, I'm just going to sign on to this disaster. You go in thinking, okay, I'm going to make the best of this. Perhaps I can make this work. You know, Dracula 2000 had so many problems shooting wise. We were basically developing in post, developing and shooting, you know, Nathan's Fillion's character we added in post-production. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so many, it was, it was such a challenge to shoot that. Um, but we had the advantage of a release date. Our title had the sell by date in, in it. Yeah. They could only fuck with us so long. We always knew it was going to end. Um, cursed, that wasn't the case. Cursed could just go on and on. That job could be a career. Um, it was, it was a, the title was appropriate. The title was it never working a movie called cursed because you, you will live up to it. You know, some of the original concepts of that film were really brilliant. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it... I mean, it drove Rick Baker out of the business for a while, right? I mean, it pretty much... Yeah, yeah. Him, right? So yeah. let me ask you a quick question. What are the... And this is probably the only podcast that's going to ask this question. Explain the economics of that to me. If you know the movie, if you don't like the movie, and you're the money people and you've wasted all this money, or at least half of that, why keep wasting more when you know you're never going to recoup it? All right. Um, the Does answer that make to that sense? is... There, you know, it totally makes sense. There's okay, two... Because okay. I don't understand films. that part There's of it. There's another film that, that at Dimension that happens at the same time. Okay. Uh, and it's called Brothers Grimm. Right. Yeah. Right. Very good. Both of them, very problematic. Both of them cost about the same mm -hmm. in reality, and both say they cost about the same um in fiction right um and after those two films what happens the company that is the miramax bank disney severs their ties with bob and harvey okay 
that relationship ends because these guys are chasing something. They're chasing a level of perfection is the wrong word, but they're chasing something and throwing more money after it, thinking that somehow they're going to have a Midas hand that's going uh -huh. to pull everything out of it. Um, and again, they're in the same boat, right? They keep, they, they, you know, they, they went into it with the best intentions and suddenly they are, fuck, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Everything they said at the beginning about why this wouldn't work was true. It still doesn't work. And then it, everything just keeps going. Well, maybe if we just spend this, it'll work. Maybe we spend this. So, you know, it's the death of a thousand cuts. It's not, it's not, my God, we're going to spend 60 more million dollars. That's not how it starts. It starts with, you know, each one of those shoots is budgeted. They're, they're smaller. We're going to spend $12 million. We're going to fix this. Oh, we only need another $6 million. We only need, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a leak under your house and suddenly you live in a sinkhole. Okay. That makes sense. Cause I couldn't, I just business wise, I don't understand it, you know? Yeah. But that's, while, that's, that's, putting... that's, that's how it happens. It's, it's nobody, nobody intended that to happen. So how much, how much better or maybe not a better is the original cut of, of, of curse to what we saw. I have them all in storage. Um, it's, <laughs> you know, it, um, it's just a little bit different. Probably the Mandy Moore, it's the Mandy Moore, Mandy Moore, which was, um, uh, replaced with, I can't remember her name in the beginning. Um, uh, the, the girl in the beginning and the, at the PETA thing, who dies in the parking garage. I can't remember if that sequence moment. had been finished, um, I think, uh, I think that would have been better. You know, I think the relationship with Skeet and Christina Ritchie and Jesse Eisenberg, you know, none of them are related. There's three strangers who meet on the road. Yeah. Uh, and you know, Christina Ritchie and Jesse Eisenberg are not brother and sister. Right. Uh, John McGinley, uh, I think is, is plays Jesse Eisenberg's dad. Um, the whole relate wrestling thing is a much bigger deal, which is very team wolf. Um, um, is it better? No. Is any version really good? No, not really. I think it, I think it was, I think the, it was a movie made for all the wrong reasons. Um, and everybody was trying to make make it work for but nobody nobody knew what they wanted and and when anybody came forward with a vision it wasn't enough you know they, they yeah it, it, it was unfortunate in that, in that in that way because it was such a great expense yeah um but you know it it uh yeah, it is what it is, I guess. I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> I know, no, 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 sorry. Uh, wait, hold I on. Honestly. We, we just caught him on a statement. He says he has all these cuts in storage. So are you why we don't have Nightmare Cafe on Blu-ray yet? <laughs> no, no, no. You got you to talk to I will find you, sir. You got to talk to MGM and NBC uh, for, for Nightmare Cafe. Nightmare uh, Cafe is one of those examples. James and I were talking about this when we were younger, before there was – every streaming every show anything you can imagine for any niche market right niche market yeah um nightmare cafe was one of those shows it's oh god i love it it won't last past episode six right yeah. and it didn't i i do have the four episodes i worked on on three quarter inch <laughs> <laughs> so, good luck and they, the, the final the final version but but yeah finding a, an old three quarter inch player i have no idea where you're gonna get that but well, yeah Oh, we, we, we went to a university that probably oh my somewhere. god you must have one there'll be one in the back in the back one of those ten thousand dollar machines <laughs> yeah that you, can, you could buy for five bucks now so, or, they, or they pay you to take it <laughs> i i i didn't i didn't even have i was making sure i ha didn't even have a cursed question but it was fascinating i'm so glad we, that's the reason why we love conversation <laughs> how did you get hooked we talked about Todd Farmer before this started mm -hmm. Todd Farmer is a fellow Kentuckian like the three of us how in the hell did you meet him uh, Why did you become I, so close, or at uh, least close working wise? Yeah, no, we're John and I are really good friends. We we um, here's what happened. I went to uh, uh, go to work at Revolution um, after my uh, first before Cursed. 
um, and was asked by Gloria Borders, who I worked with when she was up at Skywalker Sound. Um, she was then had a post at Revolution to come in and do a recut and talk about some reshoots for a movie called Darkness Falls. Yep, we've seen it. Um, so Best version of the Tooth Fairy ever. Yeah, uh, well, there was no Tooth Fairy before I got there. Uh, oh, you know, uh, we, you... Worked with, we worked with Lou Arkoff. That's where I met Lou Arkoff. Um, and uh, we, Lou and I went and worked with Stan Winston. Uh, Stan came up with the creature. We came up with the mask because the creature on its own was going to be a ratings problem if you just had that creature exposed by the time. I have the mask over there yeah. uh, in this room. <laughs> Uh, here, I'll, 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 I'll unplug While you're doing that, I'm going to grab something too to show you. So, uh, I don't know if you can see, I don't even know oh, where I'm looking cool. at. So there's the mask and the mask from Trick and then, uh, and then one of the masks from, uh, the, the Purge. That's um, amazing. That's awesome. That's uh, pretty, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, the, the Winston guys gave me that. They, they were great, you know, but we came up with the idea for the teeth and, and, and uh, how the puppet would work. We brought in a um, part of the wire crew that we worked with on, on uh, Dracula 2000 to double, um, to double for the Tooth Fairy. Uh -huh. uh, you know, do that full burn on fire during a drought in Australia and, and had to do the sequence twice, the exact moves that the pup could move. Had to, yeah. you know, because the pup could only do so many things on fire. It was suspended above a green sea. Uh, it was crazy to watch. Awesome. Um, uh, uh, David Wald, I think was his name. Uh, but after, you know, the, the movie before I came on and before Lou came on um, scored like, I think, a 25 in previews. After we came on and did, uh, oversaw, uh, wrote and oversaw 15 days of reshoots. Um, and cut them together, the movie scored a 75. That's great, yeah. So it was a huge improvement. They now had a monster. They had, the movie was very lean. We stripped it down to the bare minimum editorially. Um, you know, working with Jonathan Leavesman, he was, he was there during the process. And, and, uh, uh, and then out of that, they said, hey, do you want to direct this movie called Scarecrow that Todd Farmer was writing? Mm -hmm. uh, so Todd and I, uh, met and uh, talked through uh, where he was in the draft, read the draft. We turned around some notes. We turned it into the studio. Uh, we did a couple drafts and then uh, they were like, oh, we think we might want to do something different. And then eventually they put it into turnaround. Um, so I wasn't on the movie. Todd wasn't on the movie. And they sold the script to Sam Raimi's company uh, at the time, Ghost House, whatever it was called. And they made it as The Messengers. Yeah. Um, and then Todd's original script was basically used for the messengers too, but, um, but, uh, sort of shrunk down budget wise. Yeah. Um, but then Todd and I just stayed friends. We pitched a version of Hills of Eyes, but they already had one that they were going to do to Wes. Um, we pitched this crazy underwater ghost story that would have cost a hundred million dollars to make <laughs> we're very lucky nobody made it um uh, but we pitched it all over town and, and and that was good and then and then just stayed in touch for years and we're really good friends and wrote a number of things together and then finally um when there we needed somebody to redo all the rewrites and, and get valentine in shape to shoot i put todd in to do that um and then he and i did uh drive angry together and then uh, you know done several things since then, Trick being the one that actually got made, but we wrote a version of um, I Saw What You Did, I Know Who You Are for Dark Castle. Um, we wrote a pilot for a Canadian company and uh, a number of other things over the years. Oh, so you almost did a movie for Dark Castle. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It was back when um, they did movies and made a Back when they did movies. Or... So they, they I, I've turned out the rights for it were a little more complicated than expected. We, we wrote you know, we pitched a version of I Saw What You Did, I Know Who You Are. Do you know that premise of that? I do yes. not. Can you explain it so to me? It is, it is uh, two high school girls crank call somebody and said, I, I saw what you did, I know who you are. In the original version, they call uh, uh, a guy who's just murdered his wife. Yeah. And then he, then he chases them, hunts them right. down. So our version was two girls who do it from... Uh, the bully cheer, cheerleader's phone. They find her phone in the in the change room after PE, and they call from her phone. 
and they inadvertently call this woman who's just been murdered by an assassin. So our whole thing was we wanted to do three days of the condor in high school. <laughs> so that was the premise. And it was, and you didn't know who the killer was. There was a big scene in the middle of the movie where there's like two FBI guys, a cop, uh, 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 school liaison, all these guys who nobody knew in the room. And one of them is the killer. And you don't know who it is. Um, and with the two girls in the in locker room, then all hell breaks loose. It was, it was pretty fun. Um, but uh, ultimately, it never got made for a lot of reasons. But, yeah. So you were involved with a lot of reboots, remakes. You and Todd both. I mean, didn't you guys do it? You did. I mean, you worked on Halloween three D. Three D. Yeah, yeah. We were we were five weeks out from shooting that when when Bob Bob suddenly went dark one weekend. Nobody could figure it out. You know, we had crew hired, we had locations in, in Shreveport. We were going to shoot it in Shreveport just before we shot Drive Angry. Uh -huh. We had all the producers from Drive Angry were on board. We had it all figured out how to do it. And then nobody get a hold of Bob for the weekend. And then he calls up late Monday saying, we can't do it. We don't have the money. Uh oh. And that was that. And it was just like, what? <laughs> Um, part know? of it was yeah. they had given so much money, so much of the, their percentages away on a glorious bastards in order to get that movie released that all the profit from that they no longer had. Mm. So, so they, they just didn't have the money. And you would think it would be, Oh, a Halloween 3d. We're no brainer. Gonna have a big weekend, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a fun script. You know, I, I guess it's floating out there. They said one, one of the cons a few last year, they did a, they did a, a live reading. Oh really? It, which, yeah. 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 I don't know where it was, but I saw up. that. So also yeah. you guys did a treatment for the Fright Night? Or was it? We did. Yes. Yeah. Right. We, yeah, we, we, we pitched Fright Night. We didn't get that job. Um, uh, Marty and Oxen got that, but we pitched that. And uh, our version was, um basically uh turning the reference to the to the vamp fright night vampire movies was an 80s version that we wanted it to be jamie lee curtis and tom atkins Tom Gankin, vampire, yeah, yeah, yeah as the two vampire headers and, and and yeah that was the version we pitched it was really fun but i think todd we, had posted a description of that a few years ago on his yeah it yeah it was fun and 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 i, I would love to have loved to have done that but uh, hellraiser I, did you work? Oh yeah, Hellraiser we went for a while. And and that went through so many changes. And and the version we pitched it, it got away from very quickly, which which was unfortunate because that I still think was the best version was pitching, you know, sort of Fickner as Frank looking for the box in China. Oh yeah, that would have been yeah. perfect and yeah. the best actor to play him. Well and 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 it starts with with you know, as a pinhead thing is he ends up in the building where it's being kept which turns into a whole box itself and they hold him down and they nail three spikes in his forehead um so he's going around the rest of this, the movie with these three fucking spikes like you know <laughs> sticking out of his forehead yeah it was fun but you know whatever yeah shit happens there's so many so many stories under the bridge i uh i have to interject here because i know I, I i know the studio may not be calling you up but Speaking of uh, Fickner, uh, the, 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 I love Drive Angry, but he steals that movie. I'm fascinated oh, by the accountant as a character, Absolutely. and I wanted sequels of the accountant. Yeah, yeah, I, I, love pitched, I, I pitched that to them. I pitched that to them, and they're like, no, nah, we don't think we could do that. I've, I've totally uh, pitched that. Let's make it, it an is, accountant movie. It is. I mean, I watched that film, and I love – There's and, and what I think I love so much about that film is – there's lines in that movie I want to quote that I know I'll never have a reason to quote. Like, there's, <laughs> I'm never going to have to be like, I'm going to drink a beer from your skull. Nobody's ever going to, I'm never going to be in a situation where I can say that. But I love, it's just all so cool scenes. And they're. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. Yeah. I, we, uh, you know, yeah. He's the one person who I, I, as a fat fuck, would be okay with him looking you, fat fuck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, uh, yeah. And uh, I, I, I just so anyway, I just wanted to say that yes, I uh, um, if if for some reason they say we need one large heavy set guy from Eastern Kentucky to well, sell, I, 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 uh, you'll be the first one I call. Yeah, because right. I, I would watch I would watch the account 
as a uh, a MacGyver TV show. If you want to do it like <laughs> MacGyver, I watch that. I watch it on Netflix. Basically, I'll do it like it's like green eggs and ham. I'll I'll watch it wherever it is. That's cool. I think the I'll accountant play. is. Uh, you know, we talked about that. We talked about doing the accountant as a comic book. We talked about doing it as 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 uh, you know a version of him. We we at one point before the movie came out and didn't do so well, we had a thought of what a what a next version, next story could be. What that would be uh with with nick and 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 bill and and uh and amber and, and uh and david morse um but yeah you know uh shit uh doesn't happen sometimes <laughs> <laughs> well i said i literally i i just wanted to say that that um I love that. Well, I will let them know. I will tell yeah, them. Yeah, they yeah, should make yeah, it for yeah. you. Anytime you need it, I uh, I will lovingly just pop up and say, "No, totally make this." Here's here's my twelve dollars. <laughs> well, advance. I think I'll I think Bill would be on board. It's one of his favorite characters he's ever played. It is. Oh, yeah. Like I said, uh, that that movie um, it was everything I needed it to be when I needed it. It was, Good. It was great escapism. Oh, it was great thrilled, entertainment. Thrilled by that. Thank you. So so I I, I wanted Glad to actually interject and say thank. You. Well, you're very welcome. I'm I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. So, Tommy Atkins, Tom Atkins. I've met Tom Atkins. I've talked to Tom Atkins. Do you, does he have naked pictures of you and Todd? Is that the reason why you keep going back, or you just love Tom Tommy that much? No, I I, I fell in love with Tom the moment I met him. Yeah. I, I, I you know we we were in Pittsburgh, and uh, Tom Piccarelli, uh, uh, genre writer, novelist, um, who's since passed away. Uh, lovely guy and great writer um uh he when i was telling him we were going to pittsburgh he said tom atkins lives in pittsburgh you gotta hire tom atkins so i was like okay so it's a set up a meeting and um and uh tom and i met at a starbucks and you know we were there for i don't know an hour two hours or something like that and just we just hit it off it just like and and ever since then we're just like well you know Who's Tom going to play in this? How, how that was the only problem with, you know, when we talked about doing a sequel to Valentine, we're like, well, how do we bring Tom back with an iron jaw? <laughs> <laughs> well, he also has another great line from that: uh, "Shoot their tars." Yeah, shoot their tars. Yeah, tars, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I I adore him, and uh, he's just such a good human, and uh, he. Uh, Oh, we just swapped emails at the beginning of the of the lockdown for everybody, and he was talking about um, how much it felt like on the beach. I don't know if you've ever read that or seen the movie or anything like that old Stanley Craven movie with Craig and Pack. But it's it's apropos of the situation, and yeah. um, you know he's a very thoughtful guy and and very funny and and incredibly kind. Uh, I, I have nothing but love for Mr. Atkins. I, uh, you gave him the most cinem- literally the most cinematic death in Trick. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, and we only had Tom for 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 three days, and it was so cold. And and you know, in that scene in Trick, we we forty eight hours before we shot it, um, we were supposed to shoot it at a drive-in. Um, yeah. There was sixty mile an hour winds. And the set that we had built had started blowing away. So we found this church, which was three doors down from where we were staying. And they were like, uh, the guy, the caretaker of the church was a huge Omar Epps fan. So he was like, sure. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, it was the first church in the U.S. to have electricity. It was put in by Edison himself. Um, where was the movie shot at? I didn't look it up. Uh, Newburgh, Newburgh, New York. Okay. Up in the Hudson Valley. So um, they... Uh, welcomed us with open arms and and uh and we shot there their only thing was the next morning they had church services so we had to be have everything out so we were very cautious about well we should probably shouldn't get blood on their on their on their 150 year old organ um, so so tom's death was not as 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 uh gory as his death was in valentine <laughs> because of that. Well, let's talk a little bit about Trick. That was your last movie. How did it come about? And once again, it's you and Todd Farmer. Yeah, we we wrote it in, uh, a couple of years before, and then sort of played around with it, and wrote other things, and came back to it, and then and then uh, found a financier who was looking for 
uh, a movie to make. You know, the movie was originally budgeted at five million dollars. We originally had Dermot Mulroney in the lead because I'd worked okay. with Dermot on the Hulu movie. Uh -huh. um, but because we kept pushing and, and he was on three other, we kept pushing because they were, they don't, they had problems securing the money. Uh -huh. um, and, and, uh, Jeremy was in three TV shows at the time, the, uh, Righteous Gemstones and, yeah. uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral. And, um, I can't remember the third, but, um, we ended up losing him like 10 days before we shot. Really? So, so that was, uh, but thankfully Omar came in and who I'd worked with in Dracula 2000. I was about to say, uh, so is that, how it, is that yeah. how it happened? Yeah. The relationship yeah. from Dracula 2000? Yeah. I hadn't spoken to Omar in years, but reached out to him, um, uh, basically uh, begging and uh, he showed up and it was fantastic. So, um, you know, we, we after Valentine and, and, and because we had never got to do a sequel and we had so much sort of slasher on our brain we had wanted to dip our toes back into that arena uh -huh. and then we talked about you know wanting to try a killer that was incredibly fast and not sort of a stalker somebody who was yeah sort of brutally fast and and um uh and then it sort of reverse engineered a lot of stuff from the ending well, I was about to say, so did, yeah. you, did you have the idea of the ending of how you wanted to do it before? Originally, the first version is all supernatural. First version oh, really? So you took the supernatural part out of it? Uh, cool. Yeah. And then, and then we were like, you know, we're not going to have the money to pull that off the way oh. we had wanted it. And then, and then we were kicking around. It's like, what if we did this? What if we, and, and we were getting hit by all the, you know, the sort of the fake news shit and all that other stuff. And it's like, you know, there's a whole mentality of trying to make people believe something yeah. that may that may not be true, um, and we sort of thought that was thematically intriguing. Yeah. Um, so we lent into that, but it, you know, that was uh, that original schedule was supposed to be something like 30 days, 35 days, and five million dollars. We made it for like two and a half million dollars in 20 days, and and it was. It was a fucking race, and it was so. How did you pull cold. it off in twenty some days? Yeah, other than you being a will, <laughs> we had a great cast who were up for anything. Like, uh, no, you know, they wouldn't leave the set; they were constantly there. Um, great uh, DP. She was also the operator. Yeah, uh, Matt, she and I worked together once before, and uh, uh, you know, and Todd was there helping to rewrite things so that we could manage it in the in the time because he was also in it. Yeah, well, and he didn't take his shirt off this time. So. He didn't take his shirt off or his pants. But it was so cold. Um, you know, that scene up on the roof of that church, yeah. uh, never been so cold. That poor uh, Sasha Diamond, who, is, who plays the, the police officer who gets killed, is lying dead on that roof. Yeah. We're just shivering. We were trying to get her not to shiver whenever we tilt down. That's why you see her body so seldom, because it was it was – the wind howling off the Hudson. Um, <laughs> it was like 20 degrees and, and not including wind chill. Um, but you know, it, uh, you, you, that kind of pressure and those kind of challenges, you're, you know, again, it's the type of thing I was like, okay, this isn't necessarily the movie we set out to make, but this is the movie we're going to get to make. So Thank let's you. make the best version of that we can. Uh, you know, uh, I think some website wrongfully reported that we shot the opening party scene in like eight days, but we shot it in eight hours. Uh, you got all that in eight, eight hours. hours? Eight hours. Really? Single camera, the, with, Single camera in eight hours. With the intercutting and all the stab and the, the practice. Eight hours. And it was the way we shot it is we would shoot one part of it. And then we would reset and then we would move in and then we'd shoot it again. And Gary, we their blood. And we would always shoot and everything. The blood drove everything. Your forward yeah, progression was always right. about when you brought in the blood. So you'd be like, and, and Amanda was, cause she would, you know, have the rig on and be uh -huh. shooting it. And we, yeah, it was, it was, um, incredible how fast we had to go. And I know I need to be, we didn't actually talk about the time and length and I, I don't want to be, respectful of your time we've been on here a while but uh really quick 
you didn't edit. I know. I'm sorry. Hey, yeah. but that's a good thing that you didn't <laughs> no, know it's, it's been good. going this long. <laughs> no, my wife hasn't come knocking on the door yet. Well, so well, so hopefully good. this hasn't. Just, I always say this. Hopefully this hasn't been as bad as you thought it might be. I didn't think it would be bad at all. I thought it'd be fine, and it is. Well, fine. we've had some that have been a little rough on our side, oh, but well, that's I'm okay. Sorry. What we've had a blast, but you turned over editing on this. How was? How well, did you- uh, I, I had my own avid, but Tommy Tommy cut this, and uh, on the previous one I did, Kayla uh, Emter, she cut that, and uh, um, but I had my own avid for part of it, so I would noodle away on certain scenes, and and oh, I'm gonna just I'll just go over here and do this. So Tommy did an amazing job. Tommy Agard was uh, yeah, uh, he was the post PA when we were at Lionsgate when we were in Valentine. Oh really? Yeah, and and he had reached out to me like the year before, and uh, uh, and I was just like, yeah, I got this movie. If you want to come do it, it's it's. Um, I just knew with the schedule the way it was because we had to finish it so fast. You know, we finished, we turned the mix over, the final version over before the end of July. Uh, yeah. We didn't start shooting until the second week of March. Uh, so it was. You know, why, the had, time, why the time crunch? Why, why does it have to uh, There's no money to do it any longer. There's no money to do the, to no give it the time. It. There's no money to, you know, they, the, that was, that was a problem. So, you know, the, I had a bunch of friends up at Skywalker who, you know, had worked on all the Marvel movies. It's essentially like, like the mixer sound, the main mixer sound designer had done Steve Bodeker. He had done yeah. Black Panther and he was, he was like, absolutely. And, and they were all like, you know, this is such a difference from even from the, from the superhero movies or the Pixar movies. So we'll totally come in and kill some teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rob Zombie's talked about that when he did 31 in crowdfunding. He said he saved yeah. all the crowdfunding money. He had money, but he saved the crowdfunding for post because he said that's yeah. where you run out of money. You just, that's, there's never that's, been money for That's post. totally what happened. We, you know, Tommy ended up doing a, a, a bunch of the visual effects himself. Um, in like After Effects uh, at the end. Um, I, I was cutting in all the ADR myself. You know, we had actors doing ADR on their phones because they wouldn't pay for the end of the ADR to be done. I'm not supposed to say that, but I did. Um, okay. Um, we uh, they probably are not going to be listening to this. Anyway, uh, yes. So we uh, know that our audience isn't that huge. So <laughs> we appreciate yet. it. Yet. <laughs> Let's hope. Oh, sir. <laughs> The, the the way to be huge in this industry is to be already famous. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> we yeah, missed a step. <laughs> we missed a step. And, yeah. and we love talking to production people. And you've been yeah. absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Chad, do you well, have any? Yeah, I will say before we go, before we wrap, and I struggled because there was, a, uh, you know, we've gotten a couple actor stories. And I've been struggling going, oh, which one do I ask? But I'm going to have to. So you, you've worked with him a few times. So talk to me about Nathan Fillion. Oh, I love Nathan. Nathan is, is he's a fellow Canadian. My God. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, Nathan, um, it's funny. Nathan auditioned for Omar's part on Dracula 2000. Oh, um, really? And, and Omar's performance is actually, that part was rewritten based on Nathan's audition. <laughs> um, and then... When it came to... That's a hell of a way to give somebody a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Um, when it came to, you know, we needed to, to do, uh, add this new character in Dracula 2000. Um, they had talked about a different actor who, if we had scheduled it on one day, that other actor would be available. And I was like, no, no, no I want Nathan. Uh, Nathan, you know, could do it in any of those times. And then the producer was just like, right, well, we can't do it on those, on those other days. So we'll do it on the days that, they, you know, uh, that, that the other guy's not available. And we got Nathan to come in and do it, which was fantastic. Um, and then I worked with Nathan again on White Noise 2. And he was yeah. the first one I pitched for that. And they had just, the producers had just worked with him on Slither. Um, uh, which is a great underrated film that no one ever talks film. about. Yeah. Right. The, the, the scene at the end when he talks about, you know, to, uh, uh, tell him how I killed that deer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, James Gunn. You know, I I remember meeting James Gunn back then, and and uh, he's a he's a great filmmaker and he's a very well, good writer. That maybe maybe a, he'll go on and do something. We'll see. Maybe, maybe, maybe you we're think? holding out hope. That's another yeah. one of those. I remember being there opening night. Uh, so there, yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. were uh, we were there, the, it was not packed. No, it wasn't packed in Vancouver. We went with Nathan. Uh, we were shooting White Noise two at a time. And it was it was like oh, but I love that film. It was oh, we do too. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a great film. And 
Yeah, and I, I still uh, hear from Nathan from time to time, and we talk about working together again. We've tried a few times, and, and things haven't lined up, um, you know, because he's so busy with his TV schedule. So, well, yeah, you know, maybe uh, one, once again, if he gets, you know, something, if he get, you know, has yeah. Something. Well, we had we had talked about him playing Billy Burke's part in Drive Angry. Oh, and, really? Uh, uh. But he wasn't finished Castle in time. We already had a schedule conflict with. Uh, we already had a schedule conflict with Nick, mm -hmm. so we couldn't have any other schedule conflicts. And, and so, um, and Billy was awesome. I was thrilled to work with Billy. I'd work with Billy anytime, anywhere. Um, I love working with him. And, I love uh, the fact you don't have a lot of negative stories about actors. No, I, I, actors are great. Oh, actors. I was really tempted to ask for one specific actor who might, but I'm. Which one? Uh, Which one? Uh, it's in his very first. Uh, so, you know, we were talking about Prophecy 3 and yeah. Christopher Walken but also in that movie is one Brad Dourif <laughs> Brad was great uh, Brad is is a unique character <laughs> uh, I have we've met Brad yeah, Brad yeah. was very nice Brad, Brad was awesome in the scene where Brad's dead in that movie he was lying there in the room because uh, he had his you know sort of arm slash and he was looking up at the ceiling yeah and it was just like well we're, we're just resetting the lighting you know we're probably going to be about you know 45 minutes to an hour you know you can go and he says no no i'm i i i'm fine here <laughs> they did the whole time and to the point where we forgot he was there until somebody brought in little pizza squares uh anybody want some pizza squares and <laughs> and suddenly this corpse says say one for me um and and it was just like we literally <laughs> forgot he was sitting in the room it was um no durf was fantastic he was yeah, he's one he's one of our favorite actors and i, yeah, I just, it, like him joy. And, yeah i feel like him and nathan fillion uh, are in the same range of great actors who just I, I know nathan gets plenty of work but he does not get enough credit for his acting yeah range. i i totally agree with that nathan's an incredible talent and uh, some of the scenes and stuff we did on on white noise too which i think nobody saw less people than drive saw that than saw drive angry um and and he's wonderful in it and it's it, it has a lot of emotional complexity to it and it's in it, it's and it's this whole sort of tragic role and um yeah Nathan did a great job he was a lot of fun i tell you um about just random random nerd thing um and I don't like to th don't don't even like to talk about it. It's one of the biggest disappointments in my cinema love is uh, the Green Lantern. Oh uh, yeah. When they when they announced they were doing that movie, I was like, oh Nathan has to do this. <laughs> Nathan of course. Is the, Nathan is the Green Lantern, and then they don't cast him. They cast Ryan Reynolds. He's, because, he's the Hal Jordan you want to see. Yeah, and then and then what happens two or three years later? He is now the voice of Green Lantern in all the DC animated movies, and I'm just like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. sorry. That really, was my one dork rant. Really quick, who were you? Who did you think we were going to ask? Come on, say it. No, I, I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know. The, uh, the second you said prophecy, I figured it was Brad. Yeah, I, I was uh, sitting here foaming at the bit this whole time. Going, yeah. I need to know. No, I, 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 about didn't, Brad. I, didn't, I didn't know. I've I've been very lucky with a lot of different actors. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Well, we'll end it there. We'll end it on a positive. <laughs> I always want to ask. Who's I only have person. positive choice. I, I you know I I I I. I feel I have been incredibly lucky to do this job. And, well, and, sir, uh, tonight we've been you. incredibly lucky because you, I know this has taken a couple of years, <laughs> but that's okay. You're not the only one that's taken me a couple of years. I hope this has been as much fun for you as it has been for us. We've enjoyed the stories. We love talking our favorite thing. We actually don't talk that much to actors. We love talking to production folks. If you go right. through a lot of our catalog, Great. what, you know, we do, we do certain shows that are just us about certain things, but almost all of our interviews are with production folks, directors, production designers, writers, artists, and you have been an absolute treat. Thank you so much for well, thank you. not only thank, all the entertainment. Thank, thank, thank you all. It's been lovely to chat with you. And I love the fact that you have a Y-Wing, the original Y-Wing behind you. Oh. Uh, I have that in storage. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we will stop recording for a second. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. So this has been Bonehead. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you. Have a wonderful night.